Hello, this is Dr. David Kreller here with another video lecture about chemistry. Here I'm going to talk about the content of the first chapter of the Raymond Chong chemistry textbook, which is currently in its 11th edition. I'll start by just mentioning that I'm no longer at Georgia Southern University. I have started a new job at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. We'll start by defining the word chemistry. Chemistry deals with matter in terms of its composition and properties. Well, here's already a few more definitions. Let's define matter. Matter, in general, it's anything that has mass and volume. If you have something that has both of these properties, then you can say it's matter, of course. If something has mass, it will have weight in a gravitational field, and it will also have some physical properties, like inertia, or it will take some force to get it to move. If we say something has volume, in other words, you could say, oh, it fills or takes up some space. So if you're looking at something that has these two attributes, you could say, well, it's matter. And we do live in a world and a solar system or a galaxy or and universe that has a lot of matter. And so here's a list, just a partial list, of all the things that are actually matter. Books, planets, trees, students, pens, paper, books. I said books twice, didn't I? Cosmetics, you, your friends, your professors, the air you're breathing, exhaust of cars and motorbikes and buses, for that matter. Foods you eat, the water you drink, the shoes you are wearing. But maybe while you're watching this video, you're not wearing your shoes. Okay, let's go back. So that's a definition of matter, which chemistry is about. But specifically, we talk about matter in terms of its composition and properties. So let's look at those two words. What is meant by composition? When we say composition, we're talking about the types and amounts of simpler substances or parts that make it up. We'll leave it at that for now. Okay, then properties. We talk about matter in terms of the properties. In science, the word property means a defining characteristic that gives the stub substance its unique identity. You could say that when we discuss properties, it's kind of on the qualitative side of chemistry. And when we discuss what something is like, when we discuss composition of matter, we actually find that we see a way of classifying the matter according to composition into elements, compounds, and mixtures. When we're talking about chemistry, we discuss not just matter in a sort of a static sense. We also discuss it in a very dynamic way. Chemistry is kind of exciting and cool because we talk about the many changes that can occur within matter you know, associated with all the different and very interesting phenomena that happen within systems of matter. So there's two types of changes, chemical and physical changes. We'll talk about that in a moment. And in terms of the changes, chemistry deals with why changes actually happen in the first place, how energy is, is involved with the changes, and the sub-branches of chemistry that are concerned with the energy involvement of phenomena in chemistry is thermodynamics and thermochemistry. Okay, we can also talk about chemical systems and specifically the changes that occur within them in terms of how quickly the changes occur. That would be the subject matter of the subfield of kinetics. We can also talk about changes that occur in systems of matter in terms of the amounts of reactants that go away and products that form during chemical reactions. So that's specifically within chemical changes. We can get into the subject of stoichiometry. There's two kinds of properties, chemical properties and physical properties we need to discuss a little bit. And as it turns out, types of properties, chemical and physical, are intimately connected to the types of changes, chemical changes and physical changes. So we'll start with properties. Maybe we'll start with physical properties. What are physical properties? Those properties that the substance shows by itself without interacting with or changing into another substance. Some examples include color, melting point, boiling point, and density. So in physical changes, we'll say more about that, there are no changes in composition or formula. Or we can see physical properties without having to have the material change in composition or formula. Let's talk about chemical properties. What are chemical properties? Those properties 
that a substance displays as it reacts with or transforms into other substances. Examples of chemical properties include flammability, whether or not a substance burns, and if it burns, what's created as, say, the oxidation products. If we ask ourselves, is a material corrosive, we're, talk we're asking about its chemical properties, whether or not it's biodegradable. And to observe a chemical property, we need to cause a chemical change in which a substance changes in formula. So we're already talking about chemical changes. It's hard to talk about chemical properties without automatically talking about the idea of chemical changes. So let's do that. Well, this slide talks about actually the, the compound water is broken into its elements. And those are two words that we need to define carefully in the very near future as well, compound and element. So in a chemical change, the material changes in formula. H2O goes away. It's no longer H2O. The atoms contained in that sample that we started with rearrange themselves and we end up with hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules as the substance is broken apart into its component elements. In contrast, in a physical change, the composition of the substance does not change. A nice example to use is water undergoing a phase change here from solid to liquid. And depicted on this slide is what the solid looks like at the chemical level, and then after the melting occurs, what the liquid looks like after the phase change. You can see the differences in the organization of the component molecules. So here's a couple questions that I'm going to use as examples. We're using pictures to depict what the material might look like in our imaginations, at least at the chemical level. What kind of change is depicted here as we go from this picture initially to this picture? Just ask yourselves, is there a change in composition? Yes or no? Here's another one. What kind of change is depicted here? Uh, we're picturing molecules in the gas phase, and you can imagine kind of a formula associated with these things. So is there a change in composition? Yes or no? Anyway, let's go on to the next part. So the first thing to ask yourself when you're classifying matter according to composition is, is it uniform throughout? If not, well, then already you know basically what it is according to this classification system. It's a heterogeneous or heterogeneous mixture. But if it is uniform throughout, we have a few more questions to ask. Maybe you can ask yourself, is the composition variable? Yes, if it's variable, basically you have on your hands a mixture. And we've already defined the material as being homogeneous, so then it's homogeneous mixture such as a mixture of sugar in water. There's no rule in the universe that says a mixture of sugar and water has to have a certain composition or a certain ratio of sugar to water or concentration of sugar within the water. You know, all different kinds of mixtures like that can exist. You can have mixtures of sugar and water in which there's only a little bit of sugar or mixtures in which there's a lot of sugar or high concentration of sugar, such as when you're making drinks that aren't very sweet or are very sweet and actually can be bought at your local 7-Eleven store. If the composition is not variable, then it's a pure substance, say, such as water. And it doesn't matter exactly how much water you have. That substance is defined by the formula H2O and it can only be H2O if it's water. If it's something else with a different formula, such as H2O2, it's a different substance. So the composition is not variable, just by definition, if it's a specific substance. There's another question we need to ask now, if that substance can be separated into simpler substances. If the answer is no, then we have ourselves an element. But if the answer is yes, it can be separated into simpler substances. Like in the example of water, H2O can be broken down into its component elements, in which case we can say that the H2 is a compound. Okay, so that's classifying matter according to composition. You can use a variety of examples. We've already talked about mixtures uh, or, uh, of things like pure water, mixtures of water and sugar, and maybe some other things. And uh, maybe it's fun for you to imagine having a heterogeneous... 
I just gave you the answer. Having something like um, a piece of pizza and uh, going through this formally to define or figure out exactly what would be the way to classify it according to composition. Here's another picture which talks about the classification of matter. I like this representation of the ideas because on the same slide it not only talks about the different classifications of matter according to composition, it actually shows the changes, the nature of the changes and the way that these changes can take you from one type classification of, of material to the other. So, so physical changes can be used to break mixtures apart into their pure substances and chemical changes can be used to break compounds into the elements. Okay, so we'll say more about the difference between elements or compounds and we'll use a picture this time. Whether you define something as an element or a compound depends upon the number of elements that are present there in the substance. And we can understand that at the microscopic level an element corresponds to a specific type of atom and here in this picture there's only one type of atom depicted by these blue spheres if there's only one type of atom this material is an element and elements can be liquid solids or gases I guess in this top picture it's shown as a gas with space in between the particles and here in the lower picture, it's represented as probably a solid, nice ordered arrangement of those atoms. But it doesn't matter if it's a liquid, solid, or gas. To define something as an element according to its composition, it only needs to have a single type of atom. Which brings us to the definition of a compound. And we'll use the same kind of picture again. If a certain color of a sphere depicts a unique type of atom, then a compound is when there is a chemical combination of two types of atoms. What is a mixture? In a mixture, two or more substances are physically present in the same place at the same time. And we'll remind ourselves that in mixtures, the substances are only physically intermingling, kind of like neighbors that are next door to one another on the same block but keeping their own identities. They have not chemically reacted and each substance keeps its own identities and properties. So here's a picture picture of a mixture. You can ask yourselves, okay, what's this? This looks like an element. This looks like a compound. They're two separate substances, but if we combine these two separate substances, put them in the same place at the same time, we have ourselves a mixture. Here's another picture of a mixture. Um, whereas this was a mixture of an element that was a diatomic molecule and a compound that also was a diatomic molecule, this is a mixture of elements that are both present as monatomic gases. So do you know what elements exist as diatomic gases and what elements exist as monatomic gases? If you do, you're a good student. Okay, there's two kinds of mixtures, homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. So here we define homogeneous mixtures. The component substances that have been physically combined are well mixed and there's no boundaries between components. So if you're making a homogeneous mixture, such as a drink you're making at home, you mix it well, and you end up with something that's uniform throughout. So it has the same properties and tastes the same, um, whether you take a drink from the top, the middle, or the bottom. We'll contrast that with the heterogeneous or heterogeneous type of mixture. In this type of mixture, heterogeneous, the component substances are not well mixed and there are clear boundaries between components, such as in this rock. You look at it, you don't even really need a microscope, but you see immediately that within this rock, different locations, there's high concentrations of different of one substances, one substance versus other locations which have high concentrations or pure are pure in some other substance. That's an example of heterogeneous mixture. We also already encountered the idea of a piece of pizza 
being a heterogeneous mixture. Or any example of food is a heterogeneous mixture. Of course, if it's not baby food, which has been mixed up and homogenized so much that a very, very young baby can eat it, in which case it might be a homogenous mixture. So we'll say a little bit, mo bit more about the differences between mixtures and compounds. Here we show pictures that depict a mixture of iron and sulfur. But over here, here's a compound of iron and sulfur. What do they have in common? Well, they, there's both iron and sulfur present in both. But when there's just a mixture of the two, the two elements remain as unique substances. They just physically exist together. And here, basically, you see it's fairly heterogeneous or heterogeneous. There's large, relatively large particles of iron intermingled with big bits of matter that are molecular sulfur. And they're phys just physically intermingled, and it's not too hard to get them back apart physically, for example, by using a magnet to which the iron is attracted. So you can pull the iron away from the sulfur by using the magnet. That's a physical method of separation, actually. Okay, versus in the compound, the iron and sulfur do not exist as distinct substances. They actually have chemically combined. And those individual atoms, those individual atoms have a nice arrangement, and you have a new substance, the compound iron sulfide. And in the compound, the two elements cannot be teased apart by physical means. It would require a chemical method of separation. So here's a clicker question. I guess it's not a clicker question if you're just watching a YouTube video, but it's a question that I will use as a clicker question in class. So which one of these represents a mixture of two elements? Is it one, two, three, four, five, or six? Is it, I.e., is it A, B, C, D, E, or F? Mixture of two elements. What do you think about that? Okay, I'll we'll also ask a question about uh, types of mixtures. And is wine an example of a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture? So that brings us to the end of the first video installment of the series of videos to that covered chapter one of the Raymond Chon textbook. What have we done with the last 10 to 15 minutes of our lives? We defined several important terms for you, the student of chemistry, because you need to know some important terms. We defined chemistry which led us to a number of other interconnected definitions. We needed to define matter, composition, and properties. Specifically, we talked about two kinds of properties, chemical properties and physical properties. That led us to changes, two types of changes then, to go along with those types of properties, chemical changes and physical changes. Then we talked about classification uh, according to composition and we defined elements, compounds, and mixtures. And then two, there two types of mixtures, homogeneous mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures. So in future episodes, the next episode is going to discuss states of matter and phase changes. An often discussed topic in many YouTube videos, many excellent YouTube videos, but I will put my own spin on things in part two. So in part three, talk about something near and dear to my heart, physical methods of separation. And then in the future episodes, we'll also talk about measurements, the system international for having different units used to make measurements or discuss quantities, physical quantities. We'll talk about conversions, the factor label method, and then we'll talk about different types of errors as we wrap up chapter one as well. Talk to you very soon. Good luck.